In the midst of the World War II turmoil, a potent secret emerged, the Atomic Secret, a force of unimaginable destruction closely guarded by the United States. Yet the Iron Curtain of the USSR was not to be held back. This is the intriguing story of scientific brilliance, covert operations, political gambits, and ultimately betrayal that smuggled the atomic secret into the hands of the Soviets. As we navigate the murky waters of atomic espionage, brace yourself for a journey into the heart of the 20th century's most compelling narrative, how the Soviets got the atomic secret. Although the Soviet Union was an ally during World War II, they nonetheless launched an exhaustive espionage operation in the 1940s with the aim of uncovering the military and defense secrets of the United States and Britain. Just days after Britain's top secret decision in 1941 to initiate research on the creation of an atomic bomb, a mole within the British civil service informed the Soviets. As the highly classified Manhattan Project, the blueprint to build the bomb progressed in the United States the Soviet spy ring had insight into it even before the FBI was informed about the secret initiative. Remarkably, by August 1949, only four years after the United States used two atomic bombs on Japan, the Soviet Union had successfully detonated its own, much earlier than predicted. John Earl Haynes, an espionage historian and the author of Early Cold War Spies, asserts that the Soviets were not wanting in potential espionage recruits. However, what drove these well-educated Americans and Britons to betray their nations by divulging atomic secrets? Haynes reveals that some were influenced by ideological convictions, drawn to the ideals of communism. Others were motivated by the principle of nuclear parity. They reasoned that averting a nuclear war was possible by ensuring no single nation held a monopoly over such formidable power. The depth of Soviet spying remained enigmatic for many years. The critical breakthrough occurred in 1946 when the United States and Britain successfully cracked the code Moscow used for its telegraph cables. The decryption project, dubbed Venona, was kept a state secret until it was declassified in 1995. The authorities wanted to keep the fact they had deciphered the Russian code a secret. While Venona evidence could not be used in court, it could spark investigations and surveillance hoping to catch suspects during their espionage activities or to coerce a confession. As the decryption of Venona improved towards the late 1940s and early 1950s, it led to the exposure of several spies. Investigations resulted in the execution or imprisonment of a dozen or so individuals who had leaked atomic secrets to the Soviets, but the number of spies who managed to elude capture remains unknown. Here are a few that we know of. John Cairncross Regarded as the inaugural atomic spy, John Cairncross was ultimately identified as a member of the Cambridge Five, a cadre of upper-middle-class young men who met at Cambridge University in the 1930s, turned ardent communists, and eventually served as Soviet spies during and beyond World War II. In his capacity as secretary to the chairman of Britain's Scientific Advisory Committee, Karen Cross gained access to a top-secret report in late 1941 that confirmed the feasibility of a uranium bomb. He immediately relayed this information to Moscow agents. Karen Cross was questioned in 1951 when British agents found documents in his handwriting in a suspect's apartment while probing other members of the Cambridge spy ring. In the aftermath, Karen Cross was not indicted. Some reports claim that British officials asked him to step down discreetly, after which he moved to the United States to teach French literature at Northwestern University. Questioned again in 1964, he admitted to spying for Russia against Germany during the Second World War, but refuted allegations of providing any information harmful to Britain. He later worked for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, and subsequently resided in France. Karen Cross returned to England a few months before his passing in 1995, staunchly insisting until his final moments that the information he delivered to Moscow was relatively benign. When Russia, under its newfound democracy, released its KGB files from the previous 70 years in the late 1990s, the records confirmed that Cairn Cross was indeed the agent who supplied highly secret documentation of the British government to organize and develop the work on atomic energy. Klaus Fuchs 
Labeled as the most consequential atomic spy in history, Klaus Fuchs played a pivotal role as a physicist on the Manhattan Project, and by 1949, he was the leading scientist at Britain's nuclear facility. Just several weeks after the Soviets conducted their atomic bomb test in August 1949, a Venona decryption of a 1944 message revealed that information about key scientific processes connected to the A-bomb's development had been transmitted from the United States to Moscow. FBI agents identified Klaus Fuchs as the source. Born in Germany in 1911, Fuchs became a member of the Communist Party as a student and escaped to England during the ascension of Nazism in 1933. He pursued his education at Bristol and Edinburgh universities, proving to be a standout in physics. As a German citizen, he was briefly interned in Canada, but later allowed to contribute to atomic research in England. By the time he acquired British citizenship in 1942, he had already offered his services as a spy to the Soviet embassy in London. He was moved to the Los Alamos lab, where he began disseminating detailed information about the bomb's design, including sketches and specifics. Upon his return to England in 1946, he worked at Britain's nuclear research facility, providing the Soviet Union with information on the creation of a hydrogen bomb. In December 1949, alerted by the Venona cable, authorities interrogated him. Within a matter of weeks, Fuchs confessed all his deeds. He was tried and sentenced to 14 years in prison. After serving nine years, he was released and relocated to East Germany, where he returned to his scientific pursuits. He died in 1988. Theodore Hall For almost half a century, Fuchs was considered the most impactful spy at Los Alamos, but the secrets that Ted Hall revealed to the Soviets were not only earlier but also of equal importance as those of Fuchs. A graduate of Harvard at 18, Hall, at 19, was the youngest scientist on the Manhattan Project in 1944. Unlike Fuchs and the Rosenbergs, Hall managed to avoid punishment for his actions. Hall was involved in the experiments for the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, which was of the same type that the Soviets tested in 1949. As a young boy, Hall witnessed his family suffer during the Great Depression, and his brother advised him to change his surname from Holtzberg to dodge anti-Semitism. These tough experiences with the American system left a profound impact on young Hall, who joined the Marxist John Reed Club upon enrolling at Harvard. When recruited to work at Los Alamos, he was consumed, he admitted years later, by thoughts of how to shield humanity from the devastation of nuclear power. Eventually, while on leave in New York in October 1944, he decided to balance the scales, made contact with the Soviets, and vowed to keep them abreast of the bomb research. With the help of his courier and Harvard peer, Saville Sachs, a committed communist and aspiring author, Hall used coded references to Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass to schedule meetings. In December 1944, Hall conveyed what was probably the initial atomic secret from Los Alamos, an update on the development of the plutonium bomb. In the autumn of 1946, he enrolled at the University of Chicago, and by 1950, while pursuing his PhD, the FBI initiated an investigation into him after his real name appeared in a decoded message. However, Fuchs' courier, Harry Gold, already behind bars, was unable to identify him as one of the people, apart from Fuchs, from whom he had received secrets. Hall was never put on trial. Following a career in radiobiology, he moved to the UK and worked as a biophysicist until his retirement. When the 1995 Venona declassifications validated his spying operations from half a century earlier, he rationalized his actions in a written statement. It seemed to me that an American monopoly was dangerous and should be prevented. I was not the only scientist to take that view. He died in 1999 at the age of 74. Harry Gold, David Greenglass, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. When Klaus Fuchs confessed in January 1950, his revelations resulted in the apprehension of the man to whom he had handed over the atomic secrets in New Mexico even though the courier had used an alias. Harry Gold, a 39-year-old chemist from Philadelphia, had been transporting stolen information, mainly from American industries, to the Soviets since 1935. When the FBI found a map of Santa Fe at Gold's home, he panicked and spilled everything. Convicted in 1951 and sentenced to 30 years, his confession led authorities to other spies, 
most notably Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and Ethel's brother David Greenglass. After being drafted into the army, David Greenglass was transferred to Los Alamos in 1944, where he worked as a machinist. Inspired by his brother-in-law Julius Rosenberg, a devoted communist and New York engineer who actively recruited his friends to spy, Greenglass began to leak information from Los Alamos. In addition to Fuchs and Hall, Greenglass was the third mole within the Manhattan Project, though they were oblivious to each other's undercover operations. In 1950, as the Atomic Spy Network began to unravel, Gold, who had retrieved materials from Greenglass in New Mexico, positively identified Greenglass as his informant. This identification deflected the investigation away from Ted Hall, who was initially suspected. Greenglass confessed and implicated his wife, sister, and brother-in-law. To reduce their sentences, his wife came forward, revealing the extent of her husband's and in-law's involvement. She and Greenglass had given Julius Rosenberg handwritten documents and diagrams of the bomb, and Rosenberg had fabricated a dissected jello box as a signal. The Venona decryptions also corroborated the breadth of Julius Rosenberg's spy ring, though they were not made public. The Rosenbergs, however, denied everything and adamantly refused to name accomplices or answer many questions. They were found guilty, sentenced to death in 1951, and despite pleas for clemency, executed on June 19, 1953, in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison in New York. Because they chose to cooperate, Greenglass received a 15-year sentence and his wife was never formally charged. Lona Cohen Lona Cohen and her spouse Morris were American communists who engaged in industrial espionage on behalf of the Soviets. However, in August 1945, she obtained some Manhattan Project secrets from Ted Hall and successfully smuggled them past security in a tissue box. Following the atomic bomb drops on Japan by the United States, security was ramped up around the scientists in the Los Alamos region. After a rendezvous with Hall in Albuquerque, Lona stashed Hall's sketches and documents beneath the tissues. Upon learning that security agents were inspecting and interrogating train passengers, Lona managed to distract them by acting like a distressed woman who had misplaced her ticket, leading the police to hand her the forgotten box of tissues. Hidden beneath the tissues were the secret papers, which she then spirited away to her Soviet handlers. As the investigations and trials of the early 1950s heated up, the Cohens fled to Moscow. In 1961, the pair, under assumed names, reappeared in a London suburb, living ostensibly as Canadian sellers of antique books, a guise for their continued spying activities. Their espionage toolkit included a radio transmitter stashed beneath the fridge, false passports and antique books used to hide stolen information. During their trial, the Coens maintained their silence, once again hindering any connection to Ted Hall's spying activities. They were handed a 20-year sentence but were freed in 1969 in a swap for Britons being held in the Soviet Union. Both received the highest hero award in the country before their deaths in the 1990s. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.